I'm Marty Stauffer. The oldest living thing was a sprout when the Great Pyramids were being built. The tallest living thing is the height of a skyscraper, and the largest living thing is as wide as an average house. All are evergreens, the most enduring of our trees. One of the major questions in nature is how to survive the winter. Trees have developed two distinct solutions. Stay green the year round, like evergreens, or shed leaves and shut down, like deciduous trees. The leaves of deciduous trees turn the colors of fire in autumn and may steal the show until winter arrives. Long ago, people thought that evergreens were magical, so they brought them indoors to start the Christmas tree tradition. Evergreens have adapted to nearly every climate and geographic location. Let's investigate these magnificent trees with their branches that stay evergreen. The first trees to appear on our planet 300 million years ago were evergreens. The giant brontosaurus munched their needles. Many evergreens are of a broadleaf variety, such as these palm trees. In fact, most tropical trees, like the mangrove, are evergreen. The waxy coating on the leaves seals in moisture and keeps water loss to a minimum. The leaves hang downward to protect themselves and the fruit from the scorching rays of the sun. Hey, let's go over here, Dad. The king of trees is the giant sequoia. Today, it survives only in 60 widely scattered groves along the Sierra Nevadas in central California. A sequoia can grow 30 feet wide and 300 feet tall. Many are over 2,000 years old. This tree weighs over 3 million pounds. Its almost indestructible bark is two feet thick and resistant to fire. The giant sequoia is not quite the tallest, biggest, nor oldest tree in the world, but it is the largest tree in volume of timber. And it's a tree so sturdy that one actually had a road carved through it, though this didn't do the tree much good. The oldest known living things in the world are the bristlecone pines. One of the places they're found is here on the windy slopes of the White Mountains, also in California. 
This tortoise of the plant kingdom has been dated back as far as 4,600 years, about the same age as the Great Pyramids. Some of the older trees have just one strip of living bark left. But there is other life here. This is a female velvet ant. Actually, she's a wingless parasitic wasp. Her squeaking noise sounds a little like the creaking of these ancient trees. During each growing season, a tree adds a layer of wood, creating annual rings. In this cross section, we see wide rings grown in wet years and narrow rings grown in dry years. During prolonged dry spells, bristle cones are able to shut down and add less than an inch of growth in a hundred years. The rings also vary according to how much light and nutrition a tree receives. So they're used to help document the effects of pollution, earthquakes, and volcanic explosions by giving us information about past climates and the changing chemical contents of the atmosphere and soil. Over the centuries, these trees have been distorted by severe temperatures, blasting sand, and nearly constant wind. Hidden inside this twisted trunk is a cool drink of water for a pygmy nuthatch. Evergreens have adapted to more than just drought and heat. They can also survive the severe cold of winter. Here in Montana, the wind has turned these subalpine firs into snow ghosts. Their unique steeple shape normally helps to shed this heavy weight. But even with too much snow, their design allows the branches to bend without breaking. The shape also aids in the absorption of the sun's low winter rays. The needles can perform photosynthesis on a year-round basis. A waxy coating and resinous fill protects them against freezing temperatures. Because they contain very little sap, there's an insignificant amount of liquid in them to freeze. The small surface area of the needles slows down evaporation and conserves the tree's water supply. Cloud and fog moisture can condense on the needles, drain down, and supplement rainfall. The needles even filter nourishing mineral particles from the atmosphere. A wide variety of wildlife depends on evergreens. The trees offer shelter from the elements as well as a year-round supply of food. The most familiar evergreen to us and the most beneficial for animals is the conifer or cone-bearing evergreen. The tough resinous needles are edible by a few hardy creatures, but most prefer the nutritious seeds found within the cones. The tallest of all the conifers and of all trees is the magnificent redwood. Crossbills are dependent on pine, spruce, and other conifers. As their name implies, 
they have a beak which is completely crossed. This special design works well for cracking the cone and extracting the seeds. Many birds and animals take on the name of the evergreen they rely on for food and shelter. The pine grosbeak prefers the young spring shoots, which are tender and juicy. The pine siskin is a little finch that lives in the evergreen forest. Its voice is usually the best clue to its identity. It's especially fond of pine seeds. The pine marten lives among the conifers in search of squirrels, rabbits, mice, and birds. It will jump from tree to tree and even pounce on its prey from above. Conifer seeds are also included in its diet. The spruce grouse is one of a few species which eat the mature needles. In fact, the needles of the spruce are a staple in this bird's diet. Whether they're named after the tree or not, many animals, like this black-tailed buck, eat lichen or moss off the bark of an evergreen tree. During a harsh winter, deer may be forced to eat the bark itself. And during every winter, the snowshoe hare survives on the needles of a variety of conifers. Evergreens produce an overabundance of needles so they always have plenty to spare. But some creatures attack their life-sustaining bark with its underlying layer of juicy cambium. A single porcupine is capable of killing a substantial number of trees in a year. Luckily, porcupines only have one offspring a year, called a porcupet. Using large incisors, even this baby is able to gnaw into the inner bark and cause permanent damage to the tree. Porcupines became so prolific in Vermont's forests that the lumber companies imported from Maine the porcupine's only natural enemy, the fisher. Fishers are one of the few predators which regularly kills and eats porcupines. Today, with the predator-prey relationship restored, the fishers are thriving, and the porcupines are back in balance with the forest. During rutting season, the elk can also cause considerable damage to saplings. Before engaging rivals, it polishes its antlers. As a defense, evergreens produce a resin which aids in healing their wounds. 
It acts as a sealant against disease and insects. The sticky sap will sometimes trap small insects. Later, over the ages, buried under tons of pressure, this golden substance will become a hardened gem known as amber. Plants are divided into two basic groups, angiosperms, which have an enclosed seed like an apple, and gymnosperms, like evergreens, which have naked seeds protected by a cone. As springtime turns to summer, the pollen sacs of the male cone dry out and release a cloud of pollen. Pollen of each species has its own specific design. So each type of tree can only be pollinated by its own kind. Utilizing the wind, the geometric cone, designed to function like a wind turbine, channels the pollen around itself to maximize pollination. To reduce self-pollination, Male cones are usually numerous at the bottom of the tree, and female cones are predominantly at the top of the tree. The pollen sifts into the narrow spaces between the scales of a female cone. A scale has two ovules and requires a pollen grain in each to develop seeds. After pollination, the egg will eventually be fertilized, usually the following spring. It will then grow into a new organism called an embryo. Over the course of several years, the maturing female cone turns woody. Finally, the scales spread and drop the winged embryos, each carrying a single seed. It's surrounded by an aerodynamically designed source of food. This covering will nourish the seed through the winter. The following spring, the seed germinates and emerges from the ground. Fire is one of the forest's deadliest enemies, but is paradoxically a source of renewal and growth. Fire acts as nature's broom and sweeps away encroaching vegetation, which competes with trees for nutrients. The pulpy bark of evergreens will scorch, but not usually burn. To prevent damage to the cones, the needles burn at a relatively low temperature. After the fire has passed, the cones open to release their seeds. The jack, lodgepole, and knob cone pine have evolved this special survival technique.
In the tall redwood forest, very little sunshine is allowed beneath the dense canopy. Although redwoods have cones and can reproduce by seed, they also have a unique regenerative ability, which is rare in conifers. They often reproduce by developing shoots from the knobby burls that form along the base of the tree. A burl is a hard conglomerate of many dormant buds. These buds are not new lives like seedlings, but the same life, clones of the adult. When a tree is damaged, the clones quickly spring to life. They grow faster and have a better chance of survival than seedlings. Because water is abundant, the big conifers anchor with roots only five to six feet deep. Many are toppled over by the wind. The fallen giants soon become nurse logs, providing nutrients for new life that would not otherwise survive. This is Crater Lake in Oregon. The conifer found here is the white bark pine. It has lost the ability to open its cones. So it relies on this intelligent member of the crow family, the Clark's nutcracker, to help with dispersing the seeds. The nutcracker puts the seeds into a pouch beneath its tongue until it can stash them. Because it hides more seeds than it can eat or even find again, many of the surplus seeds will eventually germinate. Man has always relied on the evergreen for fuel and housing. The conifers, in particular, have such great commercial value that they represent 75% of the timber cut today. They're used as the major element in construction and housing, and in products from plywood to pencils. They also become pulp for paper, cellulose for cellophane, and rayon for clothing. Because of their value to the lumber industry, evergreens are grown in scientifically managed forests. But this does not always ensure a profitable harvest. The growth of many trees may already have been stunted by acid rain. But because conifer growth is slow and subject to so many influences, Evaluating the impact of acid rain will take a long time. What we do know is that conifers are quite susceptible to airborne pollution, since their needles pull moisture out of toxic-laden clouds. In this shadowy world, 
a refuge exists for an incredible variety of plant and animal life. We realize that our forests are valuable for timber, but it's also important for us to realize just how valuable they are as sanctuaries for wildlife and as living classrooms for us. It took millions of years for this complex ecosystem to develop. This silent world, sheltered by a canopy of green, is home for many creatures which can live nowhere else. From Florida palms to California redwoods, evergreens are symbols of survival. They have endured eons of winters, often thriving in soils too poor for other trees. Growing right up to timberline and north to treeline, they are the wilderness. Their graceful beauty enriches our lives, and their hidden rings illuminate our past. In return, we must ensure that the future continues bright for the evergreen. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.